Okay, so uh, I wrote my textbook in a way as a response to the question asked by The Economist um, in uh, July 2009, this melting modern economics uh, book. Um, this optimism also that there would soon be new textbooks out that would be able to explain or perhaps even predict a uh, crisis. Um, but I immediately got questions when, economy, when I told economists, colleague economists, that I was writing a pluralist textbook at the introductory level. Uh, people had not so much problem uh, across the discipline that there would be a pluralist textbook, but at the introductory level, you always got this answer, well, the basics first. And basics always appeared to be neoclassical basics. Um, I think there are a couple of answers to the question posed by the, uh, the economist. Uh, the self-fulfilling prophecy of neoclassical economic assumptions in models and behavior in the banking sector leading to too big to fail and a crisis. The efficient market hypothesis proven wrong. Economic students walking away from economics departments towards business schools where they feel more realism is taught. Relevance of Keynesian policy and QE after the crisis. And a recognition of increasing inequality as an economic problem rather than just a political or a social problem. Piketty, OECD reports, recently also the IMF. Now, the approach uh, that I quickly decided upon uh, and I also am developing a MOOC at the moment, a massive open online course based on the book that will be on in uh, uh, January, next January. Um, I decided I should draw on context from across the world. Um, most textbooks are, of course, uh, Western country based, US or European or Australian. Uh, my students, I teach at the development school, my students are largely from Africa, Asia, and Latin America. Um, so in every chapter of the book, I use a different country, and most of the countries are developing countries. Obviously, the growth chapter is on China, for example. Uh, and the chapter on financial markets is on the US. Real world examples. Um, rather than all these um, made up examples, of course I also have made up examples, um, and I use, that's the key of the method, four theories in every chapter, from broad to narrow. Broad meaning more interdisciplinary. So I start every chapter. Well, some chapters, uh, I combine theories, but I start chapters with social economics. Next comes institutional economics, and then indeed in the old institutional sense, going back to Veblen. Then post-Keynesian economics, and the fourth chapter, Oh, the fourth theory that I present in a chapter is on neoclassical economics because it is about an idealized worldview. And so the, the presentation of the theories in, in the sequence is from more realistic, but also as a trade-off less quantitative, um, towards, uh, well, less realistic uh, and more um, quantitative and more strict assumptions uh, about behavior. I try to refrain from judgments about theories, um, but there was here and there a slip of the pen. I could not help that. Um, I think the advantages of teaching a pluralist method from the beginning is that it prevents two widely spread pedagogical traps. The first trap is presenting and critiquing neoclassical economics which I think largely crowded out time. There's lots of teaching by heterodox economists that use most of the time critiquing uh, neoclassical economics, and then there's very little time available teaching alternatives. Uh, or um, neoclassical economics bashing. I think that's a complete waste of time because I don't think we have ever convinced a neoclassical economist that he or she is wrong by simply critiquing. Um, these views. Um, so rather than crowding our time or wasting time, I think uh, we should be bringing in real world context uh, and key issues that students are concerned about. 
Students nowadays are really concerned about issues of the crisis, global warming, poverty, inequality, and unemployment. So these are the symbols I use for the four uh, theories in my MOOC. Uh, social economics, do you recognize Gunnar Myrdal's idea? Yeah. Um, institutional economics, a uh, behavior guiding into a particular direction, uh, shared social norms, rules, patent behavior. Well, I thought let's take the cyclical movement for post-Keynesian economics and a balance for neoclassical economics. So on macroeconomics, so I, partly in this talk I review uh, some macroeconomic chapters in the book and partly I add from other work that I've done over the past uh, years. The idea is that I present a macroeconomic flow in the first macroeconomic chapter. So this is um, a stylized macroeconomic flow from the social economic uh, perspective. And what is key here um, is households plus communities. And there's lots of labor, UP, unpaid labor, and lots of unpaid consumption, either within households or between different households in a community, uh, caring for a sick neighbor, for example. And there is also unpaid work uh, for wider society and nature, and unpaid consumption from nature, for example, listening to birdsong. So that is how I try to capture social economics in a macroeconomic flow. Um, institutional economics, uh, what is key here obviously is uh, institutions, informal institutions as a whole set of, of patterns around beliefs and routines and attitudes, um, norms, uh, including uh, asymmetric norms, uh, stigmatizing norms, like discrimination, um, but there's also formal institutions, the FI, formal institutions regulating relationships between households and government and regulating the relationships between government and firms. Um, and I use this diagram just to add the rest of the world, which of obviously should be in all the diagrams. Um, post kensian open circular flow, um, where I introduce an injection and a leakage effect here um, and introduce, obviously, the fire sector. So, obviously, I can't put everything in, in, in each macroeconomic flow, but I highlight the distinguishing feature uh, of each theory. And the neoclassical one, um, the, the most standard one, and what I find important is to put nature as a basis of unpaid resources and also receiving ne negative externalities of production and consumption. Okay, then the chapter on growth. Um, I tried to um, uh, compare the different perspectives on growth by bringing it down in a growth equation with a mysterious X factor. Um, because, you know, in every theory there is labor and capital, so that's not so distinguishing between the four theories. But what is distinguishing is this X factor. In social economics, it's something at the meso level, something connecting the micro and the macro level. Um, some economists have referred to it as social capital, others as um, social cohesion. I like more the social cohesion because social capital can also be um, conceptualized as an individual resource that you can draw upon, you can invest in, uh, you can reap return on investments from, but social cohesion is different. Nobody owns it. It's, it's, it's a community resource that connects people together. Uh, the X factor in institutional economics, uh, I largely rely here on Hayun Chang, uh, the development institutions. Uh, without development institutions in place, uh, you will never be able to really uh, uh, set off on, on, on a growth path as a developing country at least. Uh, post kensian economics, uh, endogeneity. Um, uh, the... Uh, 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 the 
profit rate and the, uh, the growth rate are determined simultaneously. And in the new growth theory, because I thought, well, let's do neoclassical economists a favor and move immediately to new growth theory uh, and add uh, technology and human resources as the qualitative features of uh, capital and uh, labor. Okay, social economics um, starts from the idea that the economy is embedded, <laughs> embedded in society and in nature, actually uh, through a social contract. Firms, uh, by having this social contract with society, experience a reduction of, on transaction cost, and it's a, a form of legitimacy, a license to operate. Um, governments, political relationships, and social relationships, and a community economy, this third type of economy that is very much, uh, pro that's very prominent in social economics, uh, produces or, or engages in paid and unpaid work, uh, produces consumer goods and voluntary services, and also engages with the conservation of nature. Uh, money is understood as a social relation, not with three functions, but with four functions, borrowing from Marxist economics, unit of account, means of exchange, but also store of value and uh, means of accumulation. Uh, so the MC and prime. Money also being regarded as a social relation of trust and debt, IOU, and the recognition, although there's not much work in social economics of this, but to some extent, uh, writing on the, uh, social economists writing on the crisis, money is entering the economy as debt. Okay, dependency theory, when we talk about uh, development, growth, um, uh, trade, uh, particularly for developing countries, uh, Raoul Prebisch, uh, um, but also some other economists, the, the Prebisch-Singer uh, hypothesis of increasing inequality, um, and um, more modern forms of trade analysis in social economics, um, that's global value change analysis, um, with a recognition that exports also require inputs. Uh, many countries that specialize on low labor production uh, experience low value added. Lead firms tend to be oligopolistic, surplus profit, and an oversupply of inputs to the global value chains, all these small producers competing, so a race to the bottom. Um, measuring well-being. In social economics, this is always done in a multidimensional way and not in monetary terms. A human Development Index, already since 1990, uh, recognizes three capabilities. Uh, income, a capability of purchasing power in a way, life expectancy and uh, schooling. And we can compare the ranking of countries on the Human Development Index with the uh, gross national income. Uh, if we subtract GNI from HDI and we get a number bigger than zero, then these countries invest strongly in human development when it's smaller than zero, weaker in human development. Uh, I compared Bangladesh and Pakistan and Bangladesh scores a plus 10 and Pakistan scores a minus 10. Multidimensional poverty uh, with a multidimensional poverty index on deprivations and again we can compare countries. Uh, Bangladesh actually does worse than Nepal. Nepal is the champion here. 44% on the poverty rate <laughs> although having a much lower income rank, 168. Um, the explanation of poverty is largely uh, reinforcing of market forces, accumulation. Uh, that's why we needed this fourth function of uh, money, social norms and social protection deficiencies. <coughs> Institutional economics, well, the <coughs> institutions of growth, um, the idea that redistribution is not necessarily reducing efficiency but may increase efficiency based on some empirical studies on land reform in India, South Africa and uh, Brazil. Um, trade patterns and path dependency, some empirical work I did on the trade uh, agreement between Mercosur and EU. Um, infant industry protection, again work by uh, Hayun Chang on historical trade tariffs. Um, vertical inequality, the Gini index, 
and horizontal inequality, inequality between social groups and geographical groups. Um, but these are not uniform within a region. So if I take the uh, Middle East and North Africa region and I look at the gender equality index, there's quite some variation between Oman, Egypt, and Yemen. Um, feminist economics. Um, feminist economics spreads out across the, the paradigms. There's neoclassical feminist economists, there's Marxist feminist economists, and everything in between. I did some work on feminist economics and post-Keynesian economics. Um, so the question, uh, the main question is, well, what's the, the value added? Adding that to a particular paradigm, it brings in horizontal inequality, cross-cutting perspective, and it strengthens pluralism because it unpacks rational economic man. It brings in the caring economy and unpaid work, and it adds a new form of power through asymmetric institutions. Okay, so we recognize from feminist economics that gender matters. So uh, dualisms of post-Keynesian economics are then gendered. You can look at the market and money, uh, economic man uh, being, being preferred over analysis of the household, um, not much attention to unpaid work. Uh, economic woman, uh, I use the term caring spirits uh, in some of my work. Um, yeah, yeah, unpaid work and, uh, and caring. Uh, unpaid work is a stabilizer of economic cycles. There's some empirical work on that. Uh, but then reasoning from post-Keynesian economics to f feminist economics, uh, recognition of money matters, uncertainty. Okay, so there's more uncertainty than just financial fragility. There's also uncertainty, particularly in women's life events, um, uh, which affects expectations. Um, well, I have to go quick through this, but there are some common themes. There is some overlap between interests in post-Keynesian economics and feminist economics around distribution. Uh, we can calculate gendered propensities to consume, for example, asymmetric institutions. And what I did in this book on uh, feminist economics of trade is showing there's a two-way analysis. Uh, one is differential economic effects of, on men and women of the economy, but also there's effects of existing gender relations in an economy on uh, economic variables. Uh, just an example from the work of Stephanie Seguino, a strong positive relationship of the gender wage difference and uh, annual growth rate of countries um, that specialized on low-skilled labor exports. And here we see also this positive relationship with the investment share of GDP. Uh, so the interesting thing, this is not an analysis, as you see often from effects of an economic process on men and women, but the effects of existing gender relations on macroeconomic variables. Okay, two institutions uh, for MENA region countries, um, relationship, negative relationship between gender equality score and uh, formal institutions like inheritance law uh, and informal institutions um, um, like the civil liberties. We find it in the database uh, of the OECD, the CG uh, database. Neoclassical feminist economics, my method is pluralism, uh, not only limited to heterodox economics, so you can do a product, a, a uh, production possibility frontier and showing that gender inequality actually keeps a country producing below the frontier because of lack of access, for example, uh, uh, for women to land or to credit or to the labor market. Okay, my conclusion. Why do we need pluralism at the macro level? Um, I think it is possible. Um, it is necessary. And it's a response to the demand of the rethinking economics movement and its macroeconomics to its full potential. Thank you.